I'm in Grand Isle, Louisiana to ban Rufa Red Knots. The banning is part of research done by different organizations, including two national estuary programs. There are 28 national estuary programs in the United States and its territories that were established through the Clean Water Act in 1987. The Coastal Bend Bays and Estuaries Program, or CBEP, is a nonprofit organization based in Texas with the goal of protecting and restoring the health and productivity of bays and estuaries while also supporting the economic growth and public use of these areas. The Barataria Terrebonne National Estuary Program, or BITNEP, is based in Louisiana with the goal of preserving and restoring the 4.2 million acre area of the Barataria Terrebonne Estuary System. Both CBEP and BITNEP are funded by the Environmental Protection Agency in their respective states. These two organizations, along with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, and other organizations have been working to understand red knots in Louisiana. In December of 2014, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service listed the Rufa subspecies of red knot as threatened under the Endangered Species Act after bird surveys suggested the species may be in decline. The subspecies uses Louisiana's beaches and islands as stopover points during migration to and from their Arctic breeding grounds, around 7,000 miles away, although it is now known that some may spend the winter on Louisiana's barrier islands. CBEP had been studying red knots in Texas since 2009 and then partnered with BITNEP and other organizations in order to include Louisiana in future red knot studies. Since studies began, over 200 birds have been banded with alphanumeric leg flags and over 50 geolocators have been attached to red knots. This data helps researchers learn about the status of red knots, their migrations, and their habits. I drove down to Grand Isle the day before our work to stay overnight in order to get an early start the next morning. Saw some magnificent frigate birds on the way in. It was really cool. There were like seven of them that were kind of weaving in and out, and they've just returned to the island recently. So really excited about that and excited to see what tomorrow has to offer. I woke up early the next morning to join the Red Knot crew and went with Delena LeBlanc of Bitnap to scout the beaches for knots. Well, having done this so much, can you tell the knots just by their shape? Yeah, you do learn the shape. You learn how they move. Um... You learn what, what bird you might get it confused with. So black belly clovers, sometimes were a problem for me, where, or ruddy turnstones. Those, oddly enough, were birds where I might think there was a red knot and then it wasn't in the beginning. And now, I guess you do it enough, you learn them. You even see birds flying and you'll be able to set those are red knots. Part of knowing what one species does is knowing a comparison of other species that you might see with it for me. So like Sanderling is a great bird to use because it has a behavior that's very distinctive. It moves with the waves. It's smaller. Um, but the red knots, they forage in a unique way. And sometimes they're pecking along the shoreline if it's not, if they're not in the water. But if they're in the water, they have shorter legs. So the willets would have taller legs. That's how you would tell the difference between those two. Yeah, I think, I mean, for me, the more you watch, the, the better. And then shorebirds are so perfect because they are, there, is that one? Yeah. Yep. Looks like one. Yeah, this one. We stopped to look at the one knot and also found something that might frighten the average beachgoer. This is probably the, uh, we had the one knot, but this is probably the find of the day. There's a big uh, American alligator on the beach. And uh, I definitely did not think of them as something you'd find on the beach. It's kind of just getting smacked by the waves, <laughs> just hanging out. Although not often found in salt water, it is thought that American alligators can tolerate high salt environments for up to a few days. We saw a few other interesting species, but with the wind, waves, and low number of knots, it was looking like we might not capture any birds today. The method of capture is to use a cannon net, a remote-controlled apparatus that fires a net over the birds, and the pyrotechnics in it can't get wet. Therefore, we needed to find a suitable place for it with a high enough number of birds to be successful. We met back up at our home base to plan our next moves. We saw a couple knots, but the waves are so high that it's just not really feasible to do the work. So it was kind of like, you know, we might kind of not even have a chance before we even started. The waves weren't as bad earlier in the week. So we're headed to Fushan, which apparently has a steeper shoreline. And so hopefully the waves don't affect it as much. So that's like our one shot. But, uh, you know, kind of not starting off on a great note here. 
After regrouping, we spent a majority of our time looking for a good spot to set up the cannon net. They've had birds down there today. Where at Elmer? Yeah. Only down there? I'm um, not in. We don't know yet. So we're gonna just start searching that way. He said that he hadn't seen one for a while now, so what do you wanna do? Keep going? Yeah. Keep going. Without having much luck elsewhere, we ended up at one of the locations we scouted earlier, and although the conditions weren't ideal, we decided to try catching some birds anyways. So we went all the way down to the west side of Elmer's Island, didn't really see much of anything, um, and we ended up coming back to the spot we were originally, and so um, David and his crew are going to go set up while we wait here because the knots are pretty touchy. There have been occasions where they'll flush up, take off flying, and then they'll fly and we won't even know where they've landed and so you, you just don't have anything. Then you have to start the exercise again of finding the birds, a good enough flock that's foraging, and then try to set up. So. We've got uh, David and Stephanie up here right now, um, setting up our cannon net. Uh, we've got about half a dozen knots foraging with some other shorebirds um, on this one patch that they really like here on the beach. And so they're going to dig our cannon net into the ground a bit, angled up just slightly. Um, and we've got charges that um, when the birds are in front of the net, he can, he can set off and it should shoot a net out over the net, uh, birds and land pretty much down on top of it. Stephanie probably will hide up in the dunes a bit. She may be needed to help push these birds in and David's gonna go to the far side of the birds and slowly, what we call twinkle, walk them in basically uh, up into the capture zone very gotcha. carefully. So it's definitely a multiple person process. Though. Sometimes it is, yeah, yeah. Well, once we catch them, then then game's on and everybody's, everybody's getting in to help because that's, gotcha. that's when we need to um, work as fast and safely as possible. We patiently waited until the birds moved into location. Great catch! Yeah, got all four. Yeah. Look at those beauties. The red knot is a plump shorebird with a medium length bill and stubby legs. Breeding adults develop an orange underside that helps them stand out from other shorebirds. In the non-breeding season, they are muted gray and brown tones with a light stomach. Red knots can be found on all continents except Antarctica and are long distance migrants that can accumulate in large numbers during their migration. Red knots feed on horseshoe crab eggs, bivalves, worms, fish eggs, and more, using their bill to probe in the ground to find food or by sight feeding. Nesting usually occurs in the high arctic, and red knots have one brood of three to four eggs each year. Due to concern over red knot populations, they have become a flagship species for shorebird conservation. The knots were placed in shaded holding containers to keep them calm until processing. Man, that was insane. Um, the shot actually kind of caught me off guard, and then everyone, as soon as they got birds, just like rushed in. It was a crazy free for all. Probably like the fastest moving birding event I've ever been involved with. We set up a tent to provide additional shade and then started working up the birds. Considering what they had just been through, they stayed surprisingly calm throughout the entire process. I don't know if you want to do it. So. <clears throat> So this will be three, five, six. Can I grab a stick? Three, 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 five, six. Bill is Coleman, thirty-seven point two nine. Thank you. We've been uh, we've been trapping knots here in the Grand Isle and Caminata Headlands area for uh, since 2014 um, in the spring. So we're usually here at the time when birds are starting to uh, feed real aggressively, go into hyperphagia, really putting on mass this time of year. Um, they're putting on breeding plumage, you know, they're dull gray during the, uh, during the winter and they're starting to put on this beautiful reddish plumage. Um, so essentially what we're doing is trying to uh, 
kind of get a keep a keep a gauge on on how well birds are uh, are, are getting to say a target um, a target departure mass so that they can get up to the Arctic. They're going to leave from here in probably three or four weeks and try to get to. Sometimes they'll shoot straight to the Arctic. Sometimes they'll stop in James Bay uh, or Northern Prairies in the U.S. and Canada. Um, we are taking morphometric measurements. Um, it's all the standard uh, bill length and head and, and tarsus, wing cord, um, and also uh, feather. Um, we're taking a, a primary, this is the tip of a primary covert, and that we know is grown in a, in a wintering area, and we can use that to assign the, uh, the bird to a wintering area. If we know uh, matches stable isotope signature to a specific area. Um, and then, of course, we're also taking blood. In this case, the blood is for um, is for molecular sexing and also a genetics project that's going on. Um, we have some transmitters, some GPS Argos transmitters that we would be deploying, but we, all the birds from this catch are below target weight, so we're not going to put any on here. We've got 17 of, on so far this trip out of the 20 that we're we're trying to get out. Um, so eventually, those. Those transmitters, assuming they get to the Arctic, are going to give us locations of where the birds are breeding. Louisiana has undergone this tremendous loss of, of Gulf beaches, as well as tidal marshes, and just this major land loss. And as that's happening, of course, habitat's being lost for, for birds like this. Shorebirds, migratory shorebirds, are real good indicators of how the, uh, you know, just the general state of the state of the environment. So, if we're seeing something like this, where we're having really, really low weights, something's up something's wrong. Um, we don't know what that is necessarily, but it is right now a cause for concern. Um, like I said, in previous years we haven't had seen weights this low, uh, so um, we hope we can uh, just contribute the data to, to help figure out what's going on. After all the data had been collected, the knots were given time to rest before being released. Once back on the beach, they immediately started foraging again, seemingly unaffected by the banding. Hopefully they will be able to increase their weight and successfully make it up to their breeding grounds. This season, CBEP and BITNIP were able to ban 67 new birds, putting radio tags on 20 of them with 9 recaptures. The tagging data has allowed the organizations to see breeding locations for many birds, which are tending to be on the western part of the Rufa Red Knot breeding range. All in all, the information that CBEP, BITNIP, and their partners collect during their surveys is critical in increasing our understanding of Red Knot feeding and migration, and can hopefully be used to support their conservation. If you see a banded Red Knot, you can report your sighting at bandedbirds.org. It just may be one of the four Rufa Red Knots we banded today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Badgerland Birding. Should we band it?